No one over the age of 12 or with an IQ over 90 seriously believes that the Russians are going to invade anytime soon. And do keep in mind, Kharkov is a majority Russian city, a Russian-speaking city. Most people here have family members who are Russian living in Russia across the border. And so if something were actually happening, we, we would get, the, 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 we'd get the, the noise of it, you know, the rumblings, the rumors. Buna Sara, greetings from Bucharest in Romania, where I've been for the last 12 days. I think it is day 13 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the new invasion. And uh, at the beginning, we weren't so sure that the war would last this long. And during those first few days, I got many comments, and I still continue to get a lot of comments and messages asking me what I think of Coach Red Pill's coverage of the war. Uh -oh. uh, because several people wrote to me, described it as he has a different opinion to me. So, fair enough. Let's jump into that. Coach Red Pill, or Gonzalo Lira. His uh, name, he's a Chilean-American film director from what I understand. And I have previously re reacted to some of his videos about dating in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine in particular. Uh, I reacted to a video maybe about a year ago where I wasn't very impressed by his video. He more or less tried to claim that coming to Ukraine as a Western guy was like shooting fish in a barrel in terms of meeting girls, which is not the case in almost anyone's uh, experience who've been here. And now he seems to have deleted almost every video to do with dating that he had, I think 100%, even though he built up a big audience. And suddenly he's filming quite frequently from Ukraine. He says he's still in Ukraine. We're on day 13 of the invasion. So I'm going to go back and review a video that was sent to me that he shot on day three of the invasion. And obviously I'm reviewing this in hindsight a little bit. Monday morning quarterback because uh, we're now 10 days further on and uh, that also provides a good way to judge how accurate his predictions and his analysis has been. So let's get into the video. So the name of his video is What Russia Wants From Its Invasion of Ukraine and Why Zelensky is Evil. Now, Zelensky, uh, Vladimir Zelensky is the Ukrainian president, the current president. Uh, so he just, you know, his title is quite uh, sensationalist in the sense that why Zelensky is evil. Uh, I would say that most of the coverage of Pre President Zelensky outside of Russia has been, or maybe there are other countries in the world, but uh, most of the coverage in English that I've seen more or less presents him as a new Churchill, um, um, a wartime president who has performed pretty capably. But anyways, on day three, let's see what Gonzalo Lira has to say. Actually, he has two channels, Coach Red Pill and Gonzalo Lira. That's going to become relevant towards the end of the video. Uh, but I think he put this one on the Coach Red Pill uh, channel. So it's still up there. I'll also put a link to it down below. February 26. And it's the third day of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Now, the people in the United States do not seem to understand what is going on insofar as Russia's invasion is concerned. All right, in the beginning, it's just a bit of an intro. So the first, I think, interesting point comes now. But what are the Russians doing? Well, see, the Russians, they don't want to destroy Ukraine. No, they don't want to destroy it at all. What they want to do is they want to capture it intact. See? And they don't want to hurt the civilians. Why would they? From their point of view, if they harm civilians, they just create enemies. Well, that part is certainly true. If you're an invading force and you kill lots of civilians, then in general, we can assume that the local po population is really going to be hostile to you and bitter since you killed their neighbors and maybe their family members. So definitely you don't want to be doing that. They want to capture Ukraine, change the political leadership of Ukraine and install a political leadership that is sympathetic to Russia's security needs and is going to be a long-term ally. But they don't want to alienate the Ukrainian population. Because if they alienate the Ukrainian population, well, the Ukrainian population will eventually overthrow this puppet regime. And the Russians want to install a puppet regime. Let's not pretend otherwise. Yeah, that seems to have been the original strategy by Russia when they launched the invasion was to 
go for Kiev, obviously they attacked on several fronts, about four different fronts across the country. And the message from Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, was that basically he wanted regime change, he wanted to install a pro-Russian president in Ukraine. He was insulting um, uh, Zelensky, calling him a drug addict, talking about denazification, trying to uh, accuse uh, Zelensky being a Nazi, not very convincingly whatsoever, but this was the policy, right? And definitely alienating, alienating the, the local population, making them more hostile to Russia is going to be a problem because how do you occupy it afterwards with a puppet regime if the population are against the puppet you installed? And even from the outside, outside, even if you don't kill lots of civilians, you have to remember that Zelensky was elected with 73% of the vote several years ago. Now his popularity had dropped considerably uh, in between him getting elected and the invasion starting. But still, he was elected. Uh, he did, seems uh, rather hard to just, you know, invade, <laughs> um, install a new regime and, and kind of hope that the local population accept it. At some stage, uh, they're probably going to have an election and kick that person out. Well, maybe there was never really any intent to have a real election. But anyways, let's go on and see uh, what else? Um, well, maybe I'll comment because we're on day 13. So he describes it kind of benignly, uh, Coach Ripple, Gonzalo Larius. They just want to capture it. Yeah, well, that, that's very nice and everything, but we're on day 13. And uh, first of all, they haven't succeeded in getting to Kiev. Uh, the Zelensky regime is still in charge. And Russia is not just trying to capture Ukraine. There's been widespread destruction in the cities that they've gotten close to uh, and they've shelled large um, large amounts of civilian areas like in Kharkiv, in Mariupol, in Sumy, and they've caused widespread um, destruction in those cities. The center of Kharkiv, for example, uh, where I've been pretty recently with my clients, uh, looks looks pretty horrendous. The damage they've done to those, uh, you know, that are obviously on military targets, the center of the city and the bars and cafes and restaurants and clubs that I used to go to with my with my clients. Uh, and definitely they have alienated the local population quite a bit. I, I shot a video almost a week ago where I talked about how Putin was actually galvanizing the Ukrainian uh, people and actually uniting them a lot more than had been before. So it seems like it's been counterproductive. Anyways, he says that wasn't their, their plan, at least in the beginning. So that would kind of make sense. That's not, wouldn't have been a very good plan if they were doing what they've actually uh, done over the last 13 days. They want to install a puppet regime whereby the Ukrainian citizens are more or less indifferent to it. They don't want to install a puppet regime after having made the lives of Ukrainians so miserable. So that's why they don't want to destroy Ukraine or harm the Ukrainian populace. They want to capture Ukraine intact, change the political leadership, and then let it go, of course, because they don't want to manage Ukraine. They don't want it to be a burden on them. They don't want that long term. And so what are they doing? They are rapidly invading the whole country and, and everybody concedes that they're moving very, very quickly. So <laughs> he thinks they're rapidly invading the whole country. Um, I guess in those first, because he's on day three, so he's seen day one and two. Well, they attempted to attack them four fronts. They didn't actually advance rapidly. In any case, they failed basically, because we're on day 13 and they're not, you know, they, they control cities in the south of Ukraine, like Kherson, Militopol, uh, where else do they control uh, Eno, no, uh, Hodar? Uh, these are all small towns, Berdansk. Um, and Kherson is the most important strategically, but they haven't taken a big city yet, and they haven't actually encircled that many cities. They're close by in Kharkiv, but they haven't encircled it. Um, just Mariupol is the only city they've actually encircled after 13 days. So that, you know, was maybe not clear, but you know, you always have fog of war in general. And you know, a lot of information is not clear when it's happening in real time. It's only in the dust settles, you start to see, get a better picture. But they're not hitting any civilian infrastructure. They're only hitting military targets. Well, <laughs> um, that hasn't turned out to be true whatsoever, has it? Because they've been hitting a huge number of civilian targets, um, indiscriminate, well, it looks like indiscriminate shelling of the cities that they've surrounded. They blew up uh, 
many civilian airports, uh, not just military airports, and then military infrastructure. So in those few days, maybe in the first two days, that would seem to have been the plan by President Putin was to try to capture the country. But he just thought the Ukrainian army would just run off and Zelensky would uh, surrender, which is what actually Putin uh, demanded. But very quickly, uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. And what he's saying they didn't, they didn't want to do is exactly what they have been doing. So I think it's more like their preference would be to capture Ukraine without a fight. Well, I mean, who doesn't want to take something without having to wreck it? Uh, that kind of makes sense. It's kind of, I mean, I guess there may be some uh, warlords who just like wrecking stuff in general. But uh, yeah, it, isn't, it hasn't turned out to be that way for sure. So let's go on. One of the things that they want to capture intact and people don't seem to realize this, but it's very obvious if you think about it, they are trying to capture the Ukrainian army. That's not why there hasn't been any major battles with, you know, hundreds or thousands of casualties. So no major battles. Uh, there's definitely been a lot of destroyed Russian and to a certain extent Ukrainian tanks, helicopters, planes, artillery pieces. large number of dead Russian soldiers and many Russian soldiers surrounding, obviously also the same on the Ukrainian side, but it seems a lot less in terms of what I've seen recorded. Uh, I've been watching a lot on Telegram, so no major battles. Well, even those first days, they tried to take the airport just north of Kiev. Um, you just have to think of the name as a Homestel, uh, Homestel uh, Airport, and they took it. And I remember a camera crew being there with Russian troops actually having taken the airport, but the Ukrainians took it back. So there's definitely been major battles and you know, a few significant uh, Russian uh, military leaders, the second in command uh, of the Chechen forces there has died. Also, one of the leading generals from the Donetsk People's Republic. And then yesterday, a, a Russian general uh, died as well. So definitely there have been major battles. So what he's outlining as the Russian strategy might have been their kind of dream strategy that suddenly everybody, they were just going to win in three days. That hasn't turned out to be the case. And this idea that they're, they're, they're trying not to uh, kill the civilians, well, they dropped that very, very quickly uh, as their strategy. For all intents and purposes, the Russian army is tiptoeing into Ukraine. Insofar as air power is concerned, the Russians in the first three hours wiped the Ukrainian skies of everything. Well, <laughs> they haven't wiped the Ukrainian skies of everything by day 13. So this guy thought in the thir first three hours they wiped him. So I'm not sure what kind of information he was getting. It seems very um, idealistic from a military point of view. In fact, that's been one of the biggest surprises is the fact that the Russians still haven't got air dominance. And um, they de not only did they not achieve in the first three hours, uh, they haven't achieve achieved it by day 13 of the war. Um, so he's giving a very um, rose-tinted view of the Russian military campaign completely. We now know that in hindsight. Obviously, we're on day 13. And uh, yeah, you keep seeing Russian planes getting shot down regularly, helicopters, uh, aircraft, and uh, you know, you can't really fake that stuff uh, <laughs> when they show the debris of a Russian plane. Well, anyways, it seems to be taken as being true that they still continue to lose many aircraft. And actually, they even lost a Corvette, uh, was it yesterday? as well on day 12. So definitely they're not dominating things um, completely in the airspace or in the sea space entirely, although that was have a bigger advantage by sea. The Russians own the Ukrainian skies. Own the Ukrainian skies. Again, that doesn't seem to be the case either, although personally I haven't figured out how Ukraine might be still flying planes. A uh, friend of mine, Alex Christoforou, uh, and the Duran, great show, he pointed out something that I'd never considered, which is very obvious. All right, the Duran, maybe we should uh, also bring that up. So he, he went on this other YouTube channel, the Duran, uh, probably, I think it was the date of the original invasion. Yes, it was on, I guess that was February 16th, where basically they, um, they made fun of the whole idea that Russia would invade. So maybe play a clip or two from that uh, video, which took me a while to track down online because but, Actually, Duran had deleted it or at least blocked it on their YouTube channel, which isn't a big surprise because uh, the video is a bit embarrassing, I would say, in terms of how they predicted uh, the events would unfold. Let me see. 
a bus goes to the same destination, but it's carrying a bunch of random people who have very different priorities and very different goals. And they'll ride this crisis for a while until it is no longer useful to them. And it seems to me that this crisis is completely fictitious. All right, so you thought the crisis, uh, the potential vision was fictitious, not gonna happen. You know, like unicausal. Then it, it, it becomes like just this one thing and you're like wondering, well, why are these things happening or this over here is happening? But if you realize that many people are on this bus, bus and want it to go a certain way, but not too far, then it becomes a lot more understandable. I think that it's a good, useful heuristic for this situation. I think that's a brilliant metaphor, Alexander. by the way. Yeah. I, that's an absolutely brilliant metaphor, and I think you're, you're, you're completely right. Lots of people have been playing along with this and playing up with this, and you're absolutely right to say that the Russians have gained certain important points Enormous. from it. I mean, no question about Enormous. this. This actually played very well to their interests. As I said, they've never had the slightest intention of invading Ukraine. They've repeatedly denied that they have any intention. So there you have the, the, the host chiming in with his opinion that it's like completely, they never had the slightest intention. I can see why they took the video down afterwards because that doesn't, uh, didn't age well as a video. And um, very interesting is further on. Kharkov is the first city that will be taken in any potential war between Russia and Ukraine. No one over the age of 12 or with an IQ over 90 seriously believes that the Russians are going to invade anytime soon. And do keep in mind, Kharkov is a majority Russian city, a Russian-speaking city. Most people here have family members who are Russian living in Russia across the border. So there he says basically only stupid people think there's going to be an invasion. Pretty bad uh, analysis and prediction for what took place next. And he's sitting in Kharkiv at the time when he, he's doing this. And uh, I think also just his prediction on the, the force level is also kind of interesting. Uh, the force level that would be necessary for an invasion. When you decide to m invade a country, okay, moving men and materiel is not a simple task, not at all. And it leaves a lot of evidence. It's not something that you, you have to like hunt for it. It, it's all over the place. It's very obvious that somebody is getting ready to, to launch an invasion, especially if you're talking, a, a realistic invasion of Ukraine would require at least uh, 200,000 troops. I mean, at least uh, 15 divisions. I mean, it, 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 we're not talking less than that. It's just not possible. Ukraine is huge, okay? Ukraine is not one of these like Western European nations like the Netherlands, where I used to live, where, you know, Amsterdam and The Hague are like really far away. It's a 90 minute train ride away. That's how far it is. No, in Ukraine, the distances are like American distances. It's far. So there, he says that they need at least 200,000. So he says this is a very low point. It seems Russia showed up with less troops than that. Uh, so basically in summary, before the war happened, uh, Coach Red Pill, Gonzalo Lira, seemed to think that anyone who was expecting Russian invasion was basically stupid. Uh, and why would they do it with so little troops? Well, that's basically what they did. And then he's kind of flipped into talking about how they intended to capture the country in three days with so few troops, obviously. Uh, so <laughs> his track record already for predicting what's going to happen is pretty poor. And it just looks like he's just, that he's kind of trying to rationalize whatever Russia has done uh, by portraying it in a positive light. They're, they're so benign, they just want to capture it and they're going to do it in a few days without hurting anyone. Uh, but with these very small number of troops, even by his own admission. And by the way, Coach Bell, Red Pill, has made a lot more content since then, but I don't really have time to review it and go into it. Some of them are two hours long, his live streams. And um, yeah, people have sent me messages asking what I think of them, but for the moment, I'm gonna just focus on this original video that he did. Um, and blown away the entire population of Ukraine if they wanted to. They could cause a major, major humanitarian crisis if they wanted to, and they obviously don't. How do I know this? Because they haven't done it. They have had That's exactly what they did in the meantime. I mean, he's on day three. Well, they didn't manage to cause a humanitarian crisis in the first 48 hours. Yeah, because people couldn't escape. <laughs> they didn't get have enough time. They were, all the roads were blockading out of Kiev. So there wasn't, a, 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 I guess, an opportunity to cause millions of people to actually get out of the country. 13 days later, I think we're up to about 2 million people have left as refugees. 
it's a huge humanitarian crisis. Cities like Sumy, Mariupol, Kharkiv. Um, so everything he's predicted is not actually what Russia's turned out to have done. Uh, and he's giving, again, all these benign just uh, rationales for why they're behaving the way they do. Um, anyways, let's go on with the video. So he's got a terrible <laughs> record of pre uh, predicting what's going to happen. The Russians don't want to harm Ukraine. They would have destroyed Ukraine if they wanted to. But they don't. They want to capture it in one piece. Now, you can say that uh, Russia's motivations are this, that, the other. It doesn't matter. You have to look at the practical reality that is taking place now. What really bothers me, and perhaps this isn't a wise thing for me to say while I'm still in Ukraine under the Zelensky regime. What really bothers me is that the Zelensky regime has no trouble causing a humanitarian crisis. The Zelensky regime is causing the humanitarian crisis? Russia invaded Ukraine. They're the ones who are attacking the country. That's why people have to leave. How is Zelensky causing the humanitarian crisis? Well, let's listen to his rationale. They welcome a humanitarian crisis. They would love to see dead Ukrainians. Zelensky would love to see dead Ukrainians? Has he said that? Do you have any evidence? And I know this for a fact. Yeah, and do you know how I know this for a fact? Mm -hmm. Because the Zelensky government has been handing out AK-47s willy-nilly to the civilian population. As I understand it, they've already handed out 10,000 AK-47s and munitions to match. So they're giving out guns to local population to do what? Well, their official reason is so that the populace can arm themselves so that Ukrainian, mainly men, can take a gun and defend their country, their city, their family from the Russian invasion. So he says they want the humanitarian crisis. It's, anyways, <laughs> let's keep going. If you've never had any kind of military experience, you, with a weapon like that, you can become extremely dangerous to all the people around you and to yourself. Yeah, like the Russian soldiers invading. It takes training to operate a firearm. You have to know what you're doing. It's, it's not a casual thing, okay? It's not like in the movies. It's very, very dangerous. And you can harm yourself before you harm anybody else. And the harm you can cause to others is, you know, it's incalculable and, and you can't take it back. Now, the Zelensky regime is handing out these weapons, teaching people how to use Molotov cocktails, how to make Molotov cocktails and use them as, themselves. They want to foment the people to fight the war against the Russians. And the thing is, see, the Russians have professional soldiers. Now, these professional soldiers, you know, they carry a weapon, they know what to do with the weapon. If they see somebody armed, be it a man in, in a uniform or just a civilian with an AK-47, well, they're going to shoot him. Yes, and, well, obviously, if you take a gun, uh, you're effectively going to become a combatant. I think that's what he's saying, but, yeah, there are a lot of people who want to who wanna do that, apparently, in Ukraine. And so that civilian will be dead, and that will present a great photo op now, won't it? I don't think Zelensky uh, needs to give people guns and Molotov cocktails to get the good photo op of a dead Ukrainian. Russia has done that in droves since the beginning of the war. Now, maybe it wasn't apparent to him on day three, and he was dreaming of this ideal uh, military victory where the Ukrainians, I guess this idea that they were going to greet the Russians with flowers and uh, the Russian, the Ukrainian military would just uh, refuse to fight the Russian military, but like what happened in Crimea. And the government would basically abdicate because they wouldn't have a military that was willing to fight. Uh, but that's not what happened. And definitely uh, photo ops have been absolutely horrendous. Just the number of people who have been killed in bombings uh, since then. So this whole idea that it's, he's given out the guns for a photo op, well, he definitely didn't need it. And actually, that is a major issue, trying to fight your way into the cities. That the fact that you're going to have a local population that's armed with Kalashnikovs, with Molotov cocktails, because it's going to be very, very draining on Russia's resources. And a large number of Russians probably will get killed along which is what he said, a large number of Ukrainians. But yeah, to say that's the motivation, uh, he hasn't really provided a convincing argument here. Now, in other conflicts that I studied in the past when I was studying international relations, you know, it was interesting. I had a controversial professor who, who claimed that the leaders of Bosnia, they kind of went for this strategy 
because they thought that the West would intervene on the side of the Bosniaks in the war in Bosnia in the early 90s. And in fact, they weren't really trying to avoid that the Bosnian Serbs would shell civilian areas. They were actually hoping kind of would happen. So then they would say, look, they're causing this uh, outrageous war crimes. Uh, they're causing humanitarian crisis. You must intervene. Now, that didn't work very well because, well, the West didn't intervene at least for years in the war and a lot of people uh, especially Bosniaks died. Um, so it is a plausible theory that, you know, civilian casualties will galvanize support for uh, the country that's under attack or the people that, that are under the attack. But you need to provide evidence for that. And well, <laughs> Ukraine, it is, um, per perhaps it's a controversial uh, strategy if Ukraine wins. And after the war, there's lots of people with, with Kalashnikovs and you've got to get them back. Now, what I heard is that you had to give in your passport in order to get the clash from us so they can go and get the guns back after the war and try to take them off people who might do bad things, might kill other people, might just turn out to be criminals with them. But when the country's been invaded and the survival of the state itself, because remember in the speech that President Putin gave, effectively declaring war in Ukraine two year, days before the invasion, and I did a video, if you haven't seen it and read the original Kremlin translation, I'll put it down below in the description up on the card. He said two things to start with. Ukraine is not allowed to be outside of Russia's sphere of influence. So that's basically what, he, what he's referring to in terms of a puppet government being installed that would just make them sit in uh, Russia's orbit. And also the second is that he questioned the legitimacy of Ukraine's borders. So that indicates that this is also a fight for the survival of Ukraine as an entity now in, in, in its cor current shape, or at least before the war, uh, with the borders that it had de jure and de facto. So definitely the Ukrainian government has an alternative motive to what he's outlined, which is arm the populace. It's going to be really hard for the Rus Russians to win. It's going to take them a lot longer and it's going to be a lot more draining on them. And from the Ukraine's point of view, since a lot of Western analysts I saw agreed with this kind of uh, when well, he hasn't said how long it will take uh, Russia to, to occupy the country, but there was a perception that they would do it really, really quickly. Uh, and now we're at day 13, so the longer Russia, uh, Ukraine can hold out, the better for Ukraine because galvanizes support in the West, more sanctions come in which hurt uh, Russia's economy. Now, of course, President Putin would have probably factored into his calculations when he invaded, but the number of losses for Russia is something that's going to be very sensitive. And if they have to fight their way into a city with people chucking a Molotov cocktails and shooting at Kolosnikovs, it's going to push the death toll up a lot higher on both sides. And that's not probably going to be good for uh, Putin maintaining support for this war, because I'm not in Russia, I can call it a war, not a special military operation. And he does refer to this as an invasion of fairness. So uh, let's go on. So that Zelensky, can wrangle some European country or the Americans or whomever to come in and get involved in this war and potentially escalate the situation to levels that are unimaginable. The Zelensky regime is doing something frankly evil because it is evil to put civilians, to encourage civilians to do something that incredibly dangerous and irresponsible. It's a bit much to start describing Zelensky's evil and throughout the entire video or any of the videos of Zelensky's channel, not describe Putin as evil maybe. If that's the barometer uh, to put civilians in harm's way, well maybe not invade the country in the first place, that might be a good start. And second of all, obviously in between this, it's not that they didn't kill civilians in the first two days either, but obviously that has increased dramatically in the meantime. So yeah, yeah, I don't see him calling Putin evil or using that as... Um, as any court is sort of standard, it seems a bit uh, rich to go that far. The Zelensky regime has also put uh, heavy weaponry in civilian population centers. Now, these heavy weapons, howitzers and whatnot, they're dangerous. Now, Russia in previous conflicts has been involved in, in Grozny, in Chechnya in the 90s and then in Aleppo, in Syria, that's a conflict you don't really understand very well, but basically they level the cities regardless, right? So the Russian <laughs> the war has been to level cities regardless of whether there's howitzers there or not. Uh, so he seems to be trying to indicate that only because there are going to be weapons there that Russia is going to 
uh, bombed them. Well, again, in his, the city that he says he lives in, Kharkiv, they bombed the entire center of the city. And I didn't see, uh, I didn't see the howitzers or the heavy artillery in the city center that they were trying to blow up. So that is wrong, completely wrong. And it was his, the city that he lives in that got bombed pretty indiscriminately, right? So, um, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to make these things. We have to provide some evidence, like if there were photos of howitzers in the center, then, then we could have a debate about whether it's legitimate to hit those targets or not. But uh, Russia's obviously not been doing that. So again, pretty poor analysis. Just about every man between the ages of 18 and 60 is running away from the cities. That's why there are so many refugees. They've had to leave Kiev for fear of being forcibly pressed into the Ukrainian army. Middle-aged men, farts like me, who are out of shape, you know, we're real good at some business deal, but crappy at uh, carrying a backpack and a weapon uh, with no experience whatsoever in such activity. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Ukrainian uh, government, the Zelensky regime, is doing this. And why do you think they're doing it? Well, first of all, you don't forcibly conscript men into your army if you think that you're winning. Now, do you? Of course not. Well, my understanding of the conscription is that, yes, men who are between 18 and 60, I think it is, cannot leave the country and they may be conscripted in the future. But uh, Ukraine does have um, a professional army and it does have a huge number of volunteers, both for its National Guard and people who really just take a Kalashnikov and make Molotov cocktails. So I don't really see uh, that it's a strategy just to force to be conscript, press the entire male population into the army. That hasn't happened as, as yet, and we're at day 13. So again, something that, you know, just didn't, <laughs> just didn't occur. But I do understand that some people, some men, might have wanted to stay in the cities where they might have been at risk of being conscripted, so they would have moved somewhere more um, in the countryside. But that's not the humanitarian crisis. Humanitarian crisis is the fact that millions of people are fleeing the country from the Russian invasion, from the Russian rockets, from the Russian aircraft, from the Russian helicopters, from the Russian soldiers, from the Russian bullets. They're not fleeing because they're going to get pressed. The too many people are mainly women and children who have left. They're not going to get conscripted. So this is absolutely farcical as a claim at this stage. Uh, anyways, it's one that just didn't age well. Um, like a lot of this video, and his previous one that he did with the Duran. So by the way, he's been running around Kiev apparently, because I looked at his Telegram channel, and <laughs> he's been showing empty streets at the beginning of the war and claiming that people are, are terrified of the people that Zelensky's given guns to. Again, without showing any evidence. Uh, and like, it might be a problem after the war if they don't uh, get those guns back, but <laughs> people in Kiev, <laughs> the country's just been invaded by one of the biggest militaries in the world. Some guy with a Kalashnikov who's Ukrainian who might know how, need to know how to use it properly is not the biggest concern. It's not the reason that people are fleeing the country. They're fleeing it because those horrific bombings uh, and shellings of civilian areas in the cities, not just the fact that they're hitting military targets. Anyways, let's see what he, ridiculous claim he makes next. On the streets of Kiev. Outside the Premier Palace Hotel, where apparently he, he says in another video that he was asked to leave. I'm sorry if I sound a little frazzled, but, uh, you know, I'm actually worried about getting shot, man. Not, by the, not shot by the Russians or shot by the Ukrainian army, but shot by fucking criminals that the Zelensky regime has armed here in Kiev. Uh, dude, I'm so fucking angry, man. These fuckers have, are creating chaos. And this will not stop the Russians. Where is the evidence of this case? He's walking down an empty street uh, with nothing going on, claiming that uh, he's, he's concerned, maybe because he's not judging the risk assessment properly. And remember, he's from Kharkiv, and he says his family, his kids are living in Kharkiv, the city is that day or two later gets indiscriminately shelled. And he's worried about some Gopnik, I guess, that um, petty criminal that and so he might have given a gun to that is obviously not in the center from what we can see so i don't know if it's just he his risk assessment or he wants to be very sensationalist to get a lot of views might have been a good strategy from that point of view but yeah just um he's truly evil and the guy the leader that orders the shelling of those cities he hasn't called evil in any of his videos he hasn't even called them anything or even criticized them so 
let's move on with this uh, <laughs> this very uh, strange video at this stage. Because the Russian soldiers who see some civilian with a gun, well, what do you think he's going to do? Hmm? He's going to shoot him. And that innocent civilian who doesn't even know how to hold the damn weapon is going to die needlessly for nothing, for absolutely nothing. And I find that despicable. I find that truly evil. Again, truly evil. Again, he repeats this claim about Zelensky regime, the government, the ele democratic elected government of, U of Ukraine uh, is doing all this to get a photo op. While they definitely didn't need that photo op, considering what's happened over the last 13 days, there are enough images of uh, dead civilians, uh, shelling of the center of cities, um, saboteurs as well attacking a TV crew. Um, and they definitely didn't need <laughs> to, uh, uh, to give civilians guns to get a photo op of dead civilians. Russia did that all by itself. And if you want to say that the message I'm saying is pro-Russian or pro-Putin or I'm a Putin stooge or useful idiot or whatever, fine. I don't care. I mean, I don't really care your opinion, man. Yeah, of course, because you are a useful idiot and we're going to get to that very, very soon, how that turned out not too good for him. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. No, you're not. You're not telling the truth. You've got terrible analytical skills and predictions about what's going to happen before the war and during the war. But let's get into how he turned out to be a particularly useful idiot for the Russian, the Russian regime. It's almost, uh, it's almost like I'm out of a movie at this stage. I'm here. I'm here in Kiev, in the downtown, waiting for the Russians to invade the damn place, huh? So I know what I'm talking about. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, of, yeah, it might be in the mainstream media, but what you're saying is not, is not true. <laughs> the best that we can hope for is that the Zelensky regime fails in its attempt to wrangle in the Europeans and the Americans into this war. And the Zelensky regime collapses or flees or whatever. And Russia is able to take Ukraine in one piece without harming too many people. Right, so that is the dream scenario for Russia, and he advocates it. He says the best thing we could, we, could, we could hope for. I'll tell you another thing we could hope for. Russia withdraws all those troops and stops attacking Ukraine. How about that? End of problem. They leave. That would be the thing to really dream for. Not that the country collapses and it gets occupied and Russia is free to move on to the next country because it will keep going, obviously. Why would they stop? Moldova is going to be there if they take Ukraine and it doesn't have a big army. I also did a video on that. I'll link it up down and below if you want to, want to see. So, uh, and if you don't think that Putin will keep going, you haven't learned anything in the last, in the last few weeks because uh, most people who say he won't go invade somewhere else didn't think he would invade Ukraine in this way either. So, uh, yeah, you need to you know, learn from your mistakes or learn from the information and the behavior of Vladimir Putin. He's going as far as he can until he's stopped. That's just the nature of the way it is. And he's already set out, you know, all these in his speech, you know, it's, it's basically going to be Ukraine. It's basically going to be Ukraine first, most likely. Anyways, let's see if he ever gets so far. In day 13, he hasn't. So, so basically the idea there, there was that it was going to be like Crimea, which I understand that Russia might have dreamt of that again because not too many people died. There was not much uh, resistance uh, locally uh, by the population to the invasion and the annexation. And uh, yeah, if that was going to happen in all of Ukraine, then that would be great. But in the last eight years, the brand of Russia and Putin has declined rapidly in Ukraine and a lot, a lot fewer Ukrainians are that sympathetic to Russia overall because he annexed Crimea and the war in Donbass started. And on top of that, Crimea was always the part of Ukraine that was by far the most, um, most friendly to Russia, we can say. Uh, after that was going to be Donbass and then the rest of the country was even in the areas that, you know, speak Russian. If you look at the uh, voting patterns in the last elections, the most they vote for a Russia-friendly candidate is about 30%. So it's, it's a minority. Now, it's a significant minority, but it's not a big... It's not a, it's not a majority of the people in those areas. And we're seeing that uh, in the places that Russia is occupying, like in Kherson, like in Melitopol, 
uh, there are daily protests against the occupation by significant numbers of Ukrainians. Now, I'm not saying everybody there supports staying in Ukraine. I'm sure there's some people who support the invasion, but it's not, <laughs> it's not likely to be very many, judging from what I've seen. So um, that's a dream scenario that he's outlined. And that, yeah, in an ideal world for Russia, that's not going to happen, but it wasn't very realistic. And that's why I was saying when I shot my first video about this conflict back in Kharkiv in December, is that he'd, ha he'd have to be mad to go and do this because it doesn't make any sense to me. And that's what's turned out to be the case in the last 13 days. But anyways, let me go to the bit that's kind of, I guess, almost funny at the end because he was so uh, determined and outspoken and saying he doesn't care about my opinion if I think he's a useful idiot. Well, apparently he wasn't the only person uh, who thought that uh, he would work well as a useful idiot because uh, he uploaded another video, which in the meantime he's taken down again. But apparently what happened is that Russian social media channels, and let's call it for what it is, mainly Russian propaganda channels, they loved his video so much they put subtitles onto it and even, I think some even dubbed over him and circulated smaller versions of this video and other content he's made and they circulated in Russian uh, social media. So he went viral, but he went viral as a useful idiot because what he's outlined in his video is a Russian dream scenario and he's blamed the Ukrainian government for everything. So that fits in perfectly with the Russian narrative for the domestic audience. And apparently that didn't make him very popular in Ukraine and he was asked to leave the Premier Palace. That's what he says, the hotel, and he went back to Kharkiv and then he makes claims that the Valencia government is trying to, is trying to pursue him. Well, <laughs> the kind, I don't know if he actually realizes because he wasn't anticipating the invasion that Ukraine is at war, it's been invaded, and he is like a superstar on Russian propaganda channels justifying the invasion. Now what, I'm not saying that was his intention to become that huge star, but yeah, I'm sure they're concerned about him and what he's saying, since it seems to be, you know, fitting the narrative of the invading country, of the invading army, the Russian army. So I found that kind of entertaining that, yeah, he said he didn't care about being called a useful leader or being one of people thinking it, but it's kind of what he turned out to be. So um, what can I say in, in summary? Uh, he's a terrible analyst at predicting this conflict, um, probably at the level that he was when he was uh, yeah, commenting on dating in Ukraine in the video I reviewed all those times ago, all of what is over a year ago, because he clearly didn't predict that the war was going to happen. Yeah, for laughter, but he said only a stupid person would do it because I guess they had so few many truths. But that's what Vladimir Putin decided to do. Now, I agree, it wasn't a very uh, wise decision um, to do the invasion that way, and it's been proven. I mean, obviously, I'm viewing this like a Monday morning quarterback also. But, you know, when I was back in, uh, back in Kharkiv, and I was in, it just doesn't make sense to me. Even with more troops than the 200,000, I just don't see how they can occupy uh, Ukraine especially after all this damage and having to fight their way in without massive oppression of the population. I just don't see how you can do that. And you're going to need so many troops. I mean, there's some estimates are 500 to 900,000 troops to occupy it. Just seems mad, the whole thing. And that's what we've got. We have this very sad, tragic situation. And um, he's trying to basically blame Zelensky for what's happening. Uh, and now, of course, you know, as the president of the country that's uh, been invaded, he can make things better or worse, but handing out Kalashnikovs and people making Molotov cocktails to defend the city, uh, don't think that's why we have a humanitarian crisis. And I think that's been proven in the last 13 days. So I'm giving him a, I'm giving, I mean, some of the stuff he said at the beginning about the dream scenario for Russia, I mean, that's pretty accurate. It seems that's in the case. And actually, it seems the last two days that the Russian side has changed their narrative a bit. They're no longer demanding that Zelensky leave, actually, in the negotiations that they're having with the Ukrainians. Uh, they're now just, they've dropped them slightly to say that they want Ukraine not to join NATO or the EU and um, to demilitarize a very small army and basically uh, agree that Crimea will be in Russia and that these Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic are now independent. Uh, so they've stopped demanding that Zelensky be replaced by a puppet, which is kind of interesting. So they've given up on that initial strategy. So I guess he got that part right in terms of describing it, but everything else, F, 
for analysis. That's what I'm saying. So anyways, that's what I think of Coach Red Pill Gonzalo, Gonzalo Lira and his uh, videos from the beginning of the conflict. As I said, he's made a lot more content since then. I haven't had a chance to review it. Some of you, some viewers wrote to me and asked me what I think of the latest stuff. Or hey, I just saw the time he still seemed to be blaming Zelensky uh, for what's going on. Doesn't make any sense to me, uh, especially for a guy who's living in Ukraine, has found me there, that he's blaming the president and not blaming uh, Vladimir Putin for making this. But I, from my point of view, it was a tragic mistake that's going to cost the lives of not just thousands of Ukrainians, but thousands of Russian soldiers who are dying in Ukraine in fighting against a so-called brotherly nation. And what are those soldiers going to get out of it? Absolutely F all. They're going to maybe come home and maybe not and end up with Ukraine as their resting place. Very tragic everything. Anyways, that's the end of this video. I will see you in the next one. Osaro uh, Buna, since I'm in Romania. And this uh, Vidanya, do Ciao, ciao. Sar Experience.